Okay, so welcome uh, those of you who are here so far to uh, the April meeting of the Mornington Peninsula Economic Society 2022. Uh, shown on the front page here are a couple of things that have occurred in the last month. Uh, we'll start down the bottom of the astronomical thing, showing a picture there of uh, several detected uh, comets. The second one from the left is uh, Halley's Comet, and then uh, Hale Bop, a little bit larger, 60 kilometres. Halley's Comet, about 11 kilometres wide, and NASA reported detecting with the Hubble, um, uh, the largest comet so far, which uh, was actually found, first discovered in 2014, they uh, uh, denoted it uh, Bernadelli uh, Bernstein, um, after its uh, initial name that they give in uh, standard nomenclature, uh, so it's been renamed to be uh, the discoverers of uh, that particular comet. That's the largest one discovered so far, 120 kilometres across, so getting on for maybe the size of Port Phillip Bay or bigger. And um, it's uh, in a three million year orbit though, so it's not going to come back in a hurry around the sun. And the closest it's going to come to Earth anyway is about uh, out where uh, Saturn is. Uh, it's got an albedo, the amount of light that it reflects of 3%, which is um, a bit blacker than coal even. So really, really hard to detect. So not many people are going to be able to uh, observe it. And uh, it's not coming anywhere near uh, the Earth. Next up from there, uh, showing the a uh, very large uh, tapestry on the ground there. You uh, see the lady on the, uh, the top right hand side of it, Sarah Spencer. She's a software engineer that um, has uh, put together a uh, map of the night sky um, and actually sewn it. So she took an old um, sewing machine from the 1980s and uh, played, uh, played with it and adapted uh, some software to Number one, digitise um, the uh, star map per data that's available off the internet. And then number two, turn it into actually printing out a star map, as you can see, which is uh, very, very large. Now that's going to be on show at the State Library of Victoria in uh, Swanson Street in a couple of months' time for anyone uh, to see as part of a larger exhibition about uh, um, space and, uh, and other things as well. That was uh, quite interesting. Then uh, the top two at the, uh, the top there, uh, particularly those who have been in the society a while will be aware that uh, the homestead, which is 150 metres or so just down the road, um, used to contain uh, at least 10 Napoleonic artefacts because the original owners of the Briars were actually friends of Napoleon Bonaparte um, when uh, he was in exile on the island of uh, St Helena. And, um, and hence that's why uh, the restaurant that used to be here was called Josephine's because of the, uh, the, the link with uh, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. And indeed the Briars is the name of their property on St Helena where uh, the original uh, owner of the Briars, the Dutton's, actually uh, lived and they, they brought that name with them. Now shown on the right hand side there is a piece that was returned from where they were stolen from up here back in 2014 and uh, they were thought that it uh, had gone off into uh, the black market, never to be seen again, and one turned up on eBay. And uh, the art dealer from New South Wales, uh, who actually uh, discovered it, the uh, cable, uh, shown at the top there, and you can see the size of it, it's only relatively small, but there were a couple of miniature portraits like this, uh, I think there were some coins, some locks of um, Napoleon Bonaparte's hair, so if you wanted to uh, clone your own Napoleon Bonaparte and um, unleash him on the world, you could do so. Uh, but those all disappear. And uh, what I'll do for starters, before I um, move any further through, is I'll just play um, uh, an interview, it goes for about uh, uh, five, ten minutes, I think, um, where they're interviewing the uh, K-Pill about uh, what happened and what he found, and, uh, and uh, you'll uh, hear more about uh, that. So. Just do that now. You're listening to Virginia Trioli on ABC Radio Melbourne. This is a true dinx real story. At the time, at the time of the theft back in 2014, these rare Napoleonic artefacts actually received coverage in the BBC and in papers around the world. Now, when something like that, rare artefacts connected to Napoleon Bonaparte are taken, they're never going to turn up again. <laughs> they're going to be on walls or perhaps in secret recesses behind walls for all time. So you can just imagine how Lee Capel, director of Belle Epoque Fine Art and Antiques and something of an art sleuth, how he felt when he discovered an item or two on eBay and thought, hang on a minute, 
where exactly has this come from and tracked down the provenance all the way down to a regional Victorian gallery that's soon to receive again the the stolen item. Lee, is it Capel or Capel? Good morning, Lee, and I'm sorry not to know the pronunciation of your yeah. surname. Good morning, Virginia. It's Capel. Capel, good to have you on board. Yeah, thank thank Lee, you for having me on the show. Tell, tell us about the artwork we're discussing and, and where and how did you find it? So the artwork we're discussing is a portrait miniature of Josephine Bonaparte in her coronation jewels. And this was one of two, uh, a pair of uh, small miniature artworks uh, that were part of the um, Briars collection, which originally was part of the um, NGV collection. And the uh, Josephine is a gorgeous little portrait, signed Renee. So when I originally found this um, miniature on eBay, I was looking to do a portrait exhibition in my gallery in Sydney. And this particular work, I don't usually buy miniatures, but it was of such high quality and of um, uh, the age that it would have been painted during Napoleon's lifetime. So, and also the fact it was signed Renee, I believed it could have possibly been Rene Berthon, who was a portrait, portrait painter of Napoleon. So that sent me down a track of research. And so when I purchased the work on eBay, it was um, somewhat of a surprise when I started to research the background. So you, you researched the background and then you must have come across then the, the news stories about the, the theft of artefacts from the Briars historic homestead south of Melbourne here back in 2014. D did you have that jaw-dropping, oh no moment, this is a bit of thieved artwork? Of course, yeah. It was that. It was just like that. It was a jaw-dropping moment because I just I'd, I'd never come across a stolen work in my past before. Usually, when I was working through auction rooms, works would pop up and would be flagged here and there, but nothing of that was stolen from an actual museum collection. So this particular work, yeah, I, I, my jaw dropped and I didn't know what to do. And so I um, got in contact with the Mornington Peninsula Gallery, which actually uh, houses the rest of the um, the. Napoleon collection having been moved after the theft in 2014 and they were just as shocked as me. They pretty much put it as a cold case and and um, the gentleman um, who was involved uh, with the collection to begin with had since passed away. So um, it was it was such an incredible uh, sensation for both me and for the gallery. Uh, amazing. What did the gallery say to you when you uh, when you called them? Well, they said that they they'd assumed that the uh, works had were long gone, as you just mentioned before, but also that they'd been sent overseas. Originally, they believed that, it, that the 10 items were stolen uh, as part of a, a, an elaborate um, scheme by a particular collector sending in some um, some employees to, to take these works for his own collection to, to his private collection. But this sort of proved that whoever had taken them in the first place had sold them off one by one. Um, and this one ended up on eBay through a, another buyer who had purchased the work um, about eight years ago. So it was fairly close to after the theft. So d did the seller of the work on eBay, did they know what they really had here? And, and well, can I also ask you how, how much this would be worth? Well, generally, look, this, this particular work is, is worth in the range of five to $10,000, um, which is not in the art world, not a huge number, but no. in terms of the entire collection, I think the entire collection of the, the 10 works that were stolen, uh, which was a range of uh, jewellery, uh, locks of hair that belonged to Napoleon, um, even I think it was three coins that were in his pocket supposedly when he died. Um, but yeah, it was, that was valued at around $150,000. So to have one of these items pop up, I actually contacted um, in my own research the the previous owner, and she didn't you know didn't know the significance. But then, then again, I didn't want to let her know and flag um, her to the fact that it was stolen because that would perhaps affect this continual case because still there's nine items out there that are still missing. Uh, can I ask what you paid for it on eBay? And did you tell the seller that perhaps they were they were drastically undercharging for what they wanted? <laughs> well, I think well the seller they they were okay to get rid of it because they'd had it for quite some time now. Um, but they I only paid about two hundred and fifty dollars for it, which for for the actual item itself and the quality is far less than what is actually valued at. Despite the fact that it was a stolen item, but it's um yeah I got it for a bargain. So it, and I wouldn't have been able to keep it anyway. I think. Um, in my business, um, your authenticity and your reputation is everything. So yeah. if you come across uh, a stolen work, you, you you need to return it to its rightful owner. So back it goes to the rightful owner. Does someone reimburse you 250 bucks, Lee? 
<laughs> well, according to, according to Narelle Russo at the Morning Competency Gallery, um, they they're doing a fundraiser to raise the money. But I don't really care about you know I don't need to have been reinstated with my money because it's um, I think the story itself is is a fascinating thing and something that I in fact like to use because I'm also a national lecturer. I go around with ADFAS and I do talks on art. And in fact, when I was, when I locate this artwork, um, the stolen artwork, I was writing an, a lecture on art in the Third Reich and all the artworks that Hitler stole. Mm, so it was quite yes. ironic that it, it popped up at that time. Just amazing. Lee uh, Capel is with you, Director of the Belle Epoque Fine Art and Antiques Gallery, explaining how a rare Napoleonic artefact fell into his hands via eBay and is about to be returned to its rightful place, which is the Mornington Peninsula Art Gallery. Um, so you're saying this is originally from the NGV collection. Did they deaccession these pieces? So basically what happened was um, the, the whole collection was which was made up of a private collector and also the original Alexander Bolcom collection that he actually because backtracking the Briars was um, originally in a, a homestead that was established by Alexander Bolcom in the 1840s and he originally lived in St Helena and had a Briars there and he um, knew um, Napoleon personally and got a lot of these items from him directly well this fell into the um, well it was donated to um, the NGV sometime in the last century and that to be sh- shown regularly in, because in museums they have thousands and thousands of works they cannot be shown at one time they decided to loan it to the Briars um, to put on display and so now since the Briars theft mm-hmm. they've actually moved it to the Mornington Peninsula Gallery as I mentioned purely because of security um, issues. I'm looking at the BBC report that was published back in 2014 about the theft. There's a particularly gorgeous pearl ring that was taken as part of that. Have you ever made your way across that, Lee? And if you do, could you let me know first? Of course. If I And, and unfortunately, my knowledge in, in antique silver and um, jewellery is not uh, <laughs> very, very good at this point. But um, it was it was the fact that I've had a background in fine art and I'm a specialist in fine art with my gallery um, that I was able, and plus my background in Sotheby's and Menzies as a valuer, um, I was able to pinpoint this, the value of this particular painting. But if, we, if I do come across any jewellery, I'll be the first to know. <laughs> yes, and, and I'll make sure it gets back to its rightful owner as well. Damn. Sure you will. <laughs> maybe, after, maybe after wearing it for just one night. Um, yeah. Lee, is this the, the, the most curious example of a, a stolen, purloined work that you've done in your years as an art sleuth? Absolutely. Look, I've I come across quite regularly. I come across artworks that have been misattributed or they've lost their stories or their labels. Um, and it, that's what part of the fun of my job. I feel a little bit like Indiana Jones, and I'm very lucky to live <laughs> this sort of existence. But um, this particularly, this was the first time I'd come across an artwork that was stolen from a museum with such an interesting background um, that I had the opportunity to to bring joy back to that community because when it was stolen, it was a big, um, a big, uh, had a big impact on the the um, the gallery down there and the briars down there, and it was it was a very a sad day for for the community because usually you don't see the 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 items back again they go onto the black market and disappear so um i think they were just really relieved to at least have one of the items Mm. back even though there's still some missing great story really great story lee thank you so much for sharing it with us i'm being told on text the restaurant at the briars was called josephine's uh, and someone saying they remember the art and the items there being displayed in the restaurant, which doesn't seem like a very secure place to, to have <laughs> precious Napoleonic artefacts. Other wags are asking whether it's the same Napoleonic artefact that Connor Roy from Succession was trying to secure. If you know that story, you don't need me to explain what it was. Lee, make sure you photograph the handing over, won't you? I'd love to see that image on social media. Thanks so much. Will do. Thank you so much, Virginia, for having me on. Pleasure. Great story. Lee Capel, Director of Bella Pop Fine Art and Antiques. And I should imagine that the Mornington Peninsula Regional Art Gallery are going to be very had, happy to get their hands back on those items. So one returned and uh, nine to uh, go. And of course, um, uh, for those of you who live in that direction, you go along the Pian Highway, the first um, road after your other road is actually uh, Helena Street, not uh, St Helena. Again, named after Napoleon. Okay, so uh, tonight, uh, as usual, we'll go through um, the events uh, of uh, the past month and up and coming months, and uh, we'll 
show a, a talk by uh, RMIT senior lecturer Gail Isles. I'd love to get her down here one day. She's an amazing, uh, amazing speaker. Um, Sky for the month, Mark Stevens isn't here tonight, but he sent that through uh, late last night, so we'll uh, be able to show you uh, Sky for the month, including the, um, I imagine he's going to mention on there about the uh, alignment of the planets, it's going to uh, do all sorts of terrible things this month. Um, then we'll look at a couple of uh, videos afterwards on how to stop yourself being ticklish, and uh, can you walk in a straight line with your eyes closed, both of them by uh, Emily Grossman, who's a um, uh, neuroscientist, I think, uh, from memory. Uh, also, why do shower curtains uh, billow inwards? Um, uh, I uh, included that one in there because I was at a place over the weekend where they actually had a shower curtain. It's been many years since I've had a shower curtain, and indeed, yes, they do billow inwards when you turn on the water. Um, then we'll look at uh, filming actual light at the speed of light at uh, 10 trillion frames per second, so uh, a massive, uh, uh, ma massive amount of information is uh, gathered in a very, very short time with that, and that's, uh, that's uh, quite interesting to see uh, uh, what light looks like as it travels through a medium. Um, then we'll look at uh, parallel universes, and uh, here's why uh, they uh, exist. And then we'll close uh, at the end with uh, looking at the uh, speed of light to out to the uh, planet Mars uh, by a, uh, an animation from the Japanese uh, space agency, uh, JAXA. So recent events over the last month, we obviously had a members' night up here at the uh, Briars in uh, mid-March. Uh, then we had a committee meeting by Zoom where we talked about the uh, trivia nights. This was just before we held the trivia night up here at uh, the Briars. Um, also, uh, a little bit more about the uh, solar telescope, which we've now um, uh, procured and actually had it uh, here uh, previous uh, previous night here. And also the festival for the Mountain Peninsula Shire that's uh, they're running on the April 30th that we're involved in. It's now been named as being um, the Drift Festival, and it actually started today and goes for about 11 days. And we're actually on the day on uh, April the 30th down at uh, on Coolart Road in uh, Balnarring. And uh, the, the name of that sub-festival on that day is Into the Wilderness. So we'll be having to uh, set up telescopes all day and, uh, and all night there, at least until about 10 o'clock at uh, night on that day. So help from all members is uh, desperately needed uh, for that one. Uh, public night at the Briars uh, coming up on uh, the 1st of April. Um, probably... Uh, uh, may, may, may be Trevor actually uh, talking at that one. Um, sorry, oh, Trevor did talk at that one, sorry, on, on the 1st of April, but the next one won't be Trevor as he's uh, currently um, recovering from COVID and uh, um, he should be all right by the time the public night comes around, but of course you never know with uh, COVID-19. Uh, and that was a particularly uh, a fair turnout of uh, 44 people, so a lot less than actually booked, but uh, you're always gonna get people pull out at the last moment uh, due, due to sickness, particularly with the pandemic. And um, clouds went from uh, very cloudy to begin with to almost no cloud uh, later on uh, that night for those that stayed around. On the 6th of uh, April, we went down to a Luca uh, retreat down in Shura, which is just across the road from uh, Ashcombe Maze, if ever, anyone's been to uh, the Maze down in Shura, just on the other side of the road. And uh, I spoke with 75 year five students there. Um, the night started off with 100% cloud cover, and by the time I'd finished talking, um, it was uh, no cloud cover at all. So absolutely clear horizon to horizon for uh, the members there with uh, the, the telescopes. And uh, they had a good evening. In fact, they were pleasantly surprised because they were uh, having their ma expectations managed that there was not going to be anything to see in that evening. And then after they finished listening to me, uh, out they went and uh, bang, they could see the night sky very, very nicely. Uh, 8th of April, we uh, cancelled the uh, SCAG night because we didn't have any uh, prior bookings. So uh, the next one of those will be uh, next uh, quarter. And last Saturday, and I wasn't able to dial into it myself because I didn't have internet access where I was staying, um, the uh, Biennial National Australian Convention of Amateur Astronomers, NASA, um, went online, hosted by the ASV this year. and. Um, I sent around details of how to actually listen to that on the Scorpius and indeed um, if anyone's interested in any of those talks they are actually still up online um, so you can look at those at uh, a later time. So that's uh, day one of that uh, convention and by all accounts I think 
it went uh, really well and uh, somewhere around about six or seven hundred people um, listened in during the day. Uh, so I'm not sure whether that was six or seven hundred individual people or one person sort of kept coming and going many, many, many times. I'm not sure whether you can tell. So coming up uh, soon, we've got uh, the Balcom Rovers here at the Briars on uh, Friday. So we've got uh, 35 uh, senior scouts, adventurers coming and as things stand at the moment, um, I'm giving the talk and if for some reason I'm not giving the talk then uh, somebody else will uh, stand in in my uh, stead. Um, this is uh, Balcom Rovers is um, uh, Rod Brackenridge's uh, son, uh, David Brackenridge, who used to come quite often here to uh, the Briars and uh, at public nights and that, uh, is uh, one of those rovers. So he'll be here and Rod Brackenridge will be here as well uh, on uh, that night, uh, this coming Friday. So day two of uh, NASA is going to be this coming Saturday. So same deal, same links as uh, sent around on uh, East Scorpius uh, for day one of that, uh, to uh, listen to uh, those talks. Um, I'm assuming at this stage on that Saturday there's going to be a working bee and uh, a night at the Briars. Uh, if for some reason uh, it gets cancelled we'll put it out on uh, East Scorpius but I assume it's going to go ahead as uh, normal. I'm going to work on the road tomorrow. They're going to work on the road tomorrow. So, tomorrow. so the access route into the Briars is, is out of action tomorrow while they do uh, geotechnical work uh, before putting in a culvert. So um, I think they're looking at widening where the bridge is down, down by um, the rosary uh, garden and cafe down the bottom there, because you know how it's a bit of a bottleneck. I think they're looking at how do we actually expand that to make it uh, wider. Won't that affect Friday night? It won't affect Friday night. They've said it's only going to take them about five or six hours. Um, so uh, they were aware of our meeting here tonight, and they're aware of Friday night. So they've tried to work around uh, around us by, uh, by not actually interfering. That's fortunate. Uh, 27th of April, so next Wednesday uh, we'll have a Zoom uh, committee meeting, uh, right then up here. Then into this uh, in, into the Wilderness Festival on the 30th of April where we need uh, a lot of people helping. It'll be a case of bumping has to be, everything has to be set up with telescopes and everything by 1.30. Then even we lose access to get uh, in and out. So similar to what we had with Cool Art uh, when we did um, uh, the big photo exhibition uh, down there and um, and the big marquee. We'll have a marquee ourselves um, during this uh, Into the Wilderness Festival and then we're pretty much locked in until uh, 10 o'clock when the public leaves and uh, then we bump everything out uh, afterwards. So once you're in, you're in for the day. Uh, you do actually have to book uh, tickets for it. The tickets are free but you've got to go online. I suspect the reason they're doing that is um, because of COVID numbers. Um, maybe that will change as of Friday. Um, it's also possible, because it's the first time the Shire's ever done one of these uh, large festivals, that they may be looking at um, trying to um, uh, have a, uh, a mailing list for other people for next time it occurs. So this one, they've got a large federal grant uh, towards it, uh, and the idea of it is to get to tourists down to the peninsula. So we may see several thousand people in that day come through that uh, festival. I think so, yeah, I think so. So I, I, I've, I've booked tickets just in case, um, and all, all it is is an event bright thing, but it's zero dollars. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, j j just to be on the safe side. And I know Trevor's done, done that as well. Maybe you can send the link out, make it easy for people just to click on and get the tickets. Oh, yeah, I'll, I, I will definitely do that beforehand, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, 6th of May we've uh, got the uh, public night at the Briars. Uh, at this stage uh, Catherine is, uh, is back and uh, talking um, to uh, the public on that particular night, uh, all being well. Uh, 10th of May we've got uh, Lang Warren and Christian Cadets. The last time they asked for us, unfortunately we had to cancel it due to uh, COVID uh, uh, lockdowns. Uh, but uh, they're back on the, uh, the 10th of May here at uh, the Briars and uh, as things stand at the moment I'll be giving that talk. And then the next monthly meeting up here at the Briars uh, on the 18th of May. And that's a little bit of uh, the blurb they've sent out about uh, the Into the Wilderness uh, Festival. And as you see in the, uh, the middle tile there, uh, they, they show us as uh, stargazing. I couldn't actually find the one that mentions us uh, particularly, um, but I have actually seen it elsewhere, but I couldn't remember what the link was to it. 
So uh, it's going to include things such as uh, the uh, Spiegel tent and there's going to be burlesque and circus acts and all, all sorts of things as well as uh, live music on a, a couple of stages. So it's very much uh, um, an artsy type uh, thing and that obviously they see um, uh, the uh, Astronomy Society is uh, fitting quite well into that. Uh, the Society's uh, solar telescope was, is obviously going to be there as well, the one that we had uh, for during the daytime and in the evening obviously our own um, evening uh, type of telescopes, just like an ordinary public night. There's no talk involved with this one because what will happen is people will come and go in dribs and drabs right throughout the day, pretty much like when we were set up in Coolart uh, in, in previous times. They'll come, have a bit of a nose around, maybe talk and ask you a couple of questions and then go off and, and see whatever else is occurring. So tonight's talk is uh, by uh, this young lady here, um, Dr. Gail Isles from uh, RMIT, and uh, she actually holds uh, a record for uh, the number of times going up and down in the parabolic uh, aircraft that uh, simulates uh, zero G. You've probably seen on TV NASA's uh, Vomit Comet, uh, the way it sort of flies up in an inverted parabola and then on the way uh, at the top of the parabola and then coming down the uh, the participants inside are weightless. Uh, she's uh, uh, been on the, not NASA's one, but on the European Space Agency's one, and she's done it 500 times. So she holds, uh, holds the record for the number of uh, times uh, going up and down, up and down, up and down, and she looks pretty happy uh, floating there. So what this uh, talk will be about is about uh, how do we protect astronauts from space radiation? because uh, uh, the uh, environment out uh, in, in space, particularly once you get away from the magnetic field of Earth, is, uh, is particularly unforgiving, and she talks a lot about that, and some of the research that they're doing at RMIT uh, for this. So I'll play this. This goes for about uh, 40, 45 minutes. Um, as usual, if uh, you feel like getting up and having a cup of coffee, please do so at any time, just uh, quietly uh, go on out. And uh, when we uh, come back from uh, uh, after showing this, I'll show Skype for the month and then we'll break for a tea break anyway. Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Gail Isles and I'll be talking to you today about how astronauts are going to survive the journey into space for long-term missions on the Moon and Mars, and what challenges space radiation brings to those missions. Before I begin, though, I would like to acknowledge the Boomerang people and the Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nations, and I pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. In the image here, you can see Chingal, the emu in the sky, which is a lovely constellation, slightly different from the ones that we're used to. The Artemis missions will send the first woman and the next man back to the surface of the moon as early as 2024. We have a lot of work to do to prepare technology, our crew and our spacecraft if we're going to make that a reality within the next few years. The Artemis missions, just like the Apollo missions, have several phases and several stages that we must accomplish before we can have these new set of astronauts, this new modern crew set foot on the surface of the moon. So the missions range from sending probes, sending rovers and sending instruments to the surface of the moon as scouting missions, to sending the first crew to go in orbit around the moon, not to land, and to continually test the launches that are required to send these spacecraft to the moon and to test out new technologies that we're going to need for a sustainable presence on the moon. Because this time, we're not just going to the moon to set foot, walk around, collect samples and come home again. This time, we're going to the moon to stay. We're looking at setting up permanent bases on the moon, and we're also looking at setting up a permanent crude habitat on the moon we'll see people living permanently on the moon in our lifetimes. This is an incredible feat of engineering and science, but we are going to have to work to achieve it. We're going to need new materials, we're going to need new technologies, and we're going to need robust crew 
who can cope and survive in this harsh environment for longer than we've survived before. Would it be possible for humans to adapt and uh, to provide their own protection in space? Who knows? What an exciting thought. Um, certainly, the first explorers are, are going to go to the moon, to Mars, and they're going to come back to Earth. But it may not be that far into the future that we see people who are going to live permanently on these places. We're going to have people living on the moon and on, the, on Mars eventually. So how will they adapt? It's not known, of course. What we do know, from just from a six-month stay on the space station, people get longer. The, the bones in the spine just stretch out, and people can gain up to uh, one to three centimeters in height. I mean, it, as soon as they get back on Earth, they're, they're back to their normal height. But the body undergoes a lot of changes very quickly. You know, we lose muscle mass, we lose bone density. So what if people are, are living on the moon, living on, the Mar on Mars for, for a number of years, they may go through some changes that can't be reversed. Maybe they'll end up taller. Maybe they'll end up with less muscle strength, but perhaps they'll develop a, a natural protection against radiation. There are little creatures, tardigrades, have been put out into the harsh vacuum of space, not even onto uh, the moon or Mars, which does have some gravity at least, but just put out into space and they survive. There are creatures, in, um, locusts and, and cockroaches can, can survive uh, in, in um, high radiation areas here on Earth. So there's certainly some kind of biological mechanism that does protect us, put into these uh, harsh environments for long enough. Up until now, most of the astronauts who have gone into space have gone into what's called low Earth orbit. The picture here shows the International Space Station, a huge spacecraft, the largest spacecraft we've ever built and engineered. And it's been in space for the last 20 years, and we've had people in space. There's been a permanent crewed presence in space for the past 20 years. What you can see in this image is a spacecraft that is in fact very close to the Earth's surface. Astronauts on board the space station are treated to a continually changing view of the Earth as it rotates beneath them. And you can see the beautiful curvature of the Earth, because the Earth is round. And you can also see that very thin slice of the atmosphere, this tiny little shell of gas that surrounds our planet and keeps us alive. Now, of course, the astronauts and everyone contemplating traveling 400 kilometers directly upwards might feel that that is a long way away. But if we put that into context, it's actually still very close to our surface. Here we have a scale diagram of the Earth and the different orbits that are around it. So if we think about the Earth's radius, it's just over 6,000 kilometers. Then going up to aircraft, which is our first line in the diagram, we're around about 40 kilometers. Then if we look at Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite that went into orbit, that reached an altitude of 200 kilometers. The International Space Station orbits between 300 and 400 kilometers on average, and then various other satellites and spacecraft become increasingly higher in orbit. But in terms of the overall scale of things, low Earth orbit is very low compared to the size of our Earth. So this area in the image this blue area is our low Earth orbit. It's very close to the Earth's surface. Now we can go out further and we can go to a medium Earth orbit, or MEO, that's this green bar that we see here. And if we zoom out, we'll see that that stretches quite a way. This is the same diagram, smaller, still on the same scale. And you can see that a medium Earth orbit spans out quite a way until we get to the high Earth orbit out here. So in terms of satellites that we know about, we've got people down here, very close to the surface. We have our GPS, our global positioning satellites, around about 20,000 kilometers away. And then we have our weather satellites in geostationary orbit out here. 
So when we think about all of the things that are in orbit around Earth, some of them are very close, some of them are far away. But if we scale out again, we see that compared to the Moon, everything is still incredibly close to our planet. So when we think about going to the Moon and this Artemis mission that's going to send people out there, they have to travel a very long way. They have to travel 400,000 kilometers, and that's just to the Moon. Now, up until now, all of the spacecraft and all of the people in this low Earth orbit have been protected by the Earth's magnetic field. So the Earth is spinning on an axis. It contains a molten core of iron and nickel, and that's moving, it's rotating. And what that does is it generates a magnetic field that stretches an incredibly long way away from the surface of the Earth. And what that does is it generates a shield. And the shield protects us from some very nasty stuff that's coming out of our sun. Our sun gives us life, it gives us light, and it gives us heat. But it also gives us a, a lot more, and that's not conducive to life. So, if we're going to travel to the moon, how is this magnetic field going to protect us? Well, if we're behind the Earth, we're going to certainly be protected in what's called a magnetotail, the tail behind the magnetosphere, which is protecting us from all of the harmful particles that are being emitted by the sun. The problem comes, of course, when that moon moves around in its orbit and comes out here. When it's close to the sun, there's no more protection. So the astronauts who are going to go to the moon are going to have to take a lot of care and the mission planners are going to need to take care when sending those humans to the moon to see where we are in the lunar cycle, the solar cycle, and the Earth orbit. Let's look in a bit more detail at the sun. The sun is rotating very fast. The sun is a ball of hydrogen and helium in constant nuclear fusion. There are tremendous amounts of energy being emitted at any moment. There is a constant emission of not just light and heat, but particles called the solar wind. You can see that here in this animation. Particles are constantly being emitted and they're being received on every world in the solar system. Every now and again, the sun explodes and emits these huge amounts of energy in, in little pockets, as you saw just then. Sometimes those explosions and storms are accompanied by a bright flash of light. And all of this gives us some terminology when it comes to the sun. So I've spoken about the solar wind, but we also have solar flares, these bright flashes of light. You can see one forming just over here. Bright flashes of light are a solar flare. And then we also have matter that is literally spewed out of the surface of the sun, and this is a coronal mass ejection. This instrument is placed in orbit around the sun, close to the Earth, relatively speaking, and it measures these coronal mass ejections. The sun is hidden behind this shield here, and you can see a coronal mass ejection explodes out of the surface of the sun. So powerful is this explosion that it actually saturates the detectors on this satellite and it can no longer detect anything, it freezes. And you can see all of those particles saturating the detector. And then it has to reset and continue measuring. So the power and energy that's being emitted from the sun is formidable. So for us back on Earth or on the moon, these effects arrive at different times. A solar flare, which is light and a flash, is traveling at the speed of light. So if a solar flare occurs, we're going to see it in just eight minutes, the time it takes for light to travel from the sun to the Earth or the moon. Additionally, inside this solar flare, there are some X-rays and some other electromagnetic radiation. A coronal mass ejection, on the other hand, is actually a cloud of particles. So because this is matter, it's going to travel a little bit slower and it will take between one and three days for us to feel the effects of that ejection on Earth. So the speed, although it's fast, 250 to 3,000 kilometers per second, 
it still does need a little time to arrive on Earth. And the effects can be quite catastrophic. Because of the electromagnetic nature of these particles, they are charged, they can affect our GPS satellites, they can affect our navigation satellites, and they can affect our communication satellites. And in fact, a huge solar eruption in 2017 was sufficient to take out the power grid in half of Canada. The effects were catastrophic and it took days to recover from that outburst from the sun. So if we look now at the magnetic field that protects the Earth, or the magnetosphere, and see the effect of a coronal mass ejection, you can see that that curving section of our magnetic field that provides protection is completely squashed by a coronal mass ejection. The sheer force of that energy is enough to really impact the Earth and cause these major effects as I described in Canada. Again, if the moon with our brave astronauts on the surface is behind here and in our magneto tail, no problem, the moon is protected by the Earth. But if it isn't and a coronal mass ejection occurs, something we can't predict, then those crew are going to be in trouble. And there's one more to add to the mix. There's also galactic cosmic radiation. As if it wasn't enough what was coming from the sun, there is yet another source of radiation that's going to impact us. Galactic cosmic radiation comes from everywhere. It comes from our solar system, it comes from our galaxy, it comes from other galaxies, it comes from the entire universe. Now our sun has what's called a heliosphere. Our sun actually, because it also generates a magnetic field, can protect us from this galactic cosmic radiation, but not always. It depends on the activity of the sun and it depends where it is in its cycle. However, when it comes to designing spacecraft for the protection of astronauts and crew, then we're certainly going to protect them against the galactic cosmic rays as well. Let's watch those galactic cosmic rays come in. They're going to interact with the sun's heliosphere. And most of them are going to be deflected away but not all. So I keep mentioning the radiation. I keep mentioning the harmful particles. When it comes to a solar flare, the actual particles that are being emitted are protons, electrons, and some high element ions. These are atoms that have actually had the electrons stripped off them. And the problem with all of those particles is they're charged. Protons have a positive charge. Electrons have a negative charge. These high Z ions have a positive charge. The coronal mass ejections are also emitting protons and electrons. The galactic cosmic radiation has protons, nucleons, electrons, and it also has a bit of antimatter. As if all that wasn't bad enough, we then have an additional problem. The additional problem is that when the solar flares, the coronal mass ejections, and the galactic cosmic rays impact other materials, they generate secondary radiation. So this brings into the soup of particles neutrons and gamma rays. So when it comes to designing our spacecraft, we have to allow for all of these things and we have to protect against all of these particles. Here on Earth, those solutions are relatively easy. If we want to protect ourselves against alpha particles or positively charged particles that are traveling reasonably slowly, we can do so with something as thin as paper or even our own skin. Electrons are a bit smaller, so we need something that's a bit more dense than paper or skin. And aluminium is a good metal for that. Lots of spacecraft are made out of aluminium. If we want to protect against gamma rays, which have a higher penetrating power, then we're going to need a much thicker material. So often lead is used. Lead is found in nuclear facilities around the world and in medical institutions and facilities. Neutrons are particularly tricky because we can't see them and they're very difficult to detect. However, water, which we have a lot of on our planet, 
is a great shield against neutrons. And the image I've chosen here is the nuclear reactor that's in Sydney, managed by the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization. And here at the center, there is a uranium core that is constantly undergoing nuclear fission, but the neutrons that are emitted are moderated or slowed down by a pool of water. And it's the hydrogen in water that provides the protection. Hydrogen is a particularly special element when it comes to shielding against neutrons. And so many materials that have high amounts of hydrogen, such as plastics or concrete, are used for shielding here on Earth. The challenge we face with spacecraft and launching anything into space is that launching things requires fuel. Fuel is expensive. And so our spacecraft, ideally, are going to be as lightweight as possible. That rules out the possibility of using lead, and it certainly rules out the possibility of using concrete, both of which are very heavy. It would just simply cost too much to launch. So the engineers and scientists that are responsible for designing spacecraft have got to come up with the perfect combination of materials that will provide not just a cost-effective launch, but they must also be durable to withstand the rigors of the space environment, but they must also provide a radiation shield. And so you can see the challenge becomes more and more complicated. Here I'm showing a picture of the Columbus Laboratory. It's one of the modules on the International Space Station. And this diagram shows how the structure is split through a kind of sandwich arrangement of materials. So the bumper shield that is facing space, that's this shiny metal surface, is actually a very thin piece of aluminium. What follows next is an air gap. Air is a good protection against radiation. It is a medium through which the particles have to travel and it will slow them down. Next, there come some materials, Kevlar, epoxy, Nextel. These are the kinds of materials that are found in, uh, say, protective jackets for emergency workers or military. These are materials that are high in hydrogen, but they're also a fabric, so they can be worn and molded around the human body and are flexible so that we can continue working whilst wearing them. And they're used inside the spacecraft walls to provide not just radiation shielding, but also to act as a kind of net in case any meteors or debris actually penetrates the first outer hull, they'll be caught in this fabric net and hopefully not make it through into the pressurized portion of the spacecraft. Next comes another air gap, again, slowing these particles down. And then there's a third layer of aluminium. And from then onwards, you're inside the spacecraft and that's where the people live. So you can see at the moment, the technology is fairly simple. It's a sandwich of materials. It's using the lightweight aluminium that we know we can launch cost effectively and we're even using something as basic as air to slow down the particles. Up until now, we've taken materials from Earth and sent them into space. But a lot of work is being done on researching, utilizing the resources that are already in space. One of the proposed solutions for a habitat on the moon is to actually use the, the, the material on the surface of the moon itself and igloo style build blocks out of what's called the lunar regolith and use those to build habitats. Just make blocks using this, this shiny uh, silver soil. Another solution is to abandon that altogether and just go and live underground like we did in our first days on, on the earth. We, we, we started out living in caves because they provided the natural protection. And in fact, that is a great solution from many elements. There are actually lava tubes under the surface of the moon. And these are being proposed as our first habitats because not only are they going to protect against the, the, the rapid temperature changes that are encountered in, not only in space, but on the moon in particular, but it will also provide a radiation shield, a very natural one. 
We just need to find a way to convert that into being uh, pressurized and, and safe to live in. So I see a combination of all of these things. I see that we'll perhaps take up some equipment, a bit of machinery with us to the moon. We'll put it in place on the moon and then we'll start to get a bit of a, uh, a manufactory going on the moon where we will utilize the surface. And there's some great materials up there. Most of the surface of the, of the moon or 50% of the surface is a material called silica, SiO2. We know it as sand or glass here on earth. So it's, it's actually a very versatile material. So if we had the machinery to convert that into solar panels, solar panels are made out of silica. Then we've got a power source for when the sun isn't shining on the surface. We can manufacture even 3D printed blocks out of this material. And then if we get our machinery advanced enough, then we can even start to uh, start smelting the surface and we can get pure silica, pure alumina, pure even oxygen out. Uh, and then we have um, even uh, a breathable source. So yes, I think we certainly need to look far more to uh, recycling and, and uh, uh, you know, a circular use of materials once we're out there, because there's a lot of great resources. We really don't want to be launching everything from Earth every time. So in terms of the people inside the spacecraft, they are receiving what's called a radiation dose. And we need to monitor how high that dose gets when those astronauts are working in space. Here down on the surface of Earth, we are all subject to a radiation dose. It's natural, it's in the rocks around us, it's in the food that we eat, it's a natural uh, occurring phenomenon by the, the nature of the Earth itself. So typically we receive a dose of say 0.2 millisieverts of radiation in, in a year. So here we have sea level doses and annual doses. So maybe up to two millisieverts per year is what any of us are receiving at any time and we survive quite fine, no problem. If you're to have a CT scan, you'll get a fair old dose, but that's in one go. And as long as you don't have them every day, you'll be fine. There'll be no problem. Somebody who's a radiation worker, so perhaps somebody who works with an MRI machine in a hospital, or somebody who administers x-rays, they're counted and classed as a radiation worker. So they need to monitor how much radiation they're receiving on, in their day-to-day -day work, and that's totaled up over the whole year. Their rate is slightly higher. They're now in the kind of 20 millisievert range. Aircraft pilots and commercial pilots and air crew, they're all monitored as well, because the higher you go in altitude, the thinner the atmosphere becomes, the less protection there is, and the higher the radiation doses become. So even the, the astronauts on board the International Space Station, although they're very close to the surface of the Earth in the grand scheme of things, they are still getting a higher dose than we would get down here on Earth. So they're around about the, the 100 millisievert range. And if we look forward to the days when we'll be traveling to Mars, the doses become very high. Now, in terms of the damage that that's going to do to our bodies, if we look at six months average on the ISS, with a dose of about 100 millisieverts, then there is a statistical risk of cancer, and you may even suffer from mild radiation sickness. Now, it is sad, but true, that some of the astronauts who have been to the International Space Station have developed cancer as a result of being on the space station. So if we're going to even contemplate sending people to Mars, we have to be aware of these cancer risks. And in fact, if we look at merely the travel to Mars, before we even set foot on the surface, we have an increased risk of cancer. We are now up in the sievert range. And after 30 days, there is a 10% risk of death. Would you want to take that risk? How much do you want to go to Mars? Well, the 
human research program of NASA say that this risk is currently unacceptable. So we are not going to be sending people to Mars anytime soon. Perhaps in the year 2035, we'll have developed the technology to cope with this risk and to mitigate it. But at the moment, we simply don't have that technology. So back to our astronauts on the space station. Scientists around the world do radiation modeling on the modules of the space station. They put in radiation detectors and see how much radiation those detectors pick up, both in a simulated sense and a real sense. And then they shield for that radiation accordingly. So the top image here is showing the Zvezda module, one of the first modules that was launched of the space station. This is managed by Roscosmos, the Russian space agency. And it shows how much radiation is impacting on the radiation detector if there's no shielding in place. If additional shielding is put in place, then it reduces the dose that arrives at the detector. And we can protect our astronauts better. And this protection is simply in the form of plastic blocks. So this is polyethylene blocks. Here's an example of a block, and they are simply put into the walls of the spacecraft. So Svesta has some sleeping quarters, as do other modules on the space station, and they have additional polyethylene shielding, and polyethylene is a plastic. It contains mainly carbon and hydrogen, and that hydrogen is the key element that's going to protect not only from these electrons and protons that are coming in, but also the neutrons that are generated. These blocks of polyethylene, these plastic shields, are what's called passive shielding. When we want to protect people against radiation, then we can either limit the time of the exposure, which is not possible in space, we can limit the distance from the radiation source, again, not possible in space, or we can simply put a barrier between the people and the radiation. And that is really the only solution that's available to us in space. So we're making use of that with what's called passive shielding. The shielding is just simply a block in between the people and the radiation. On top of this passive shielding, we can also ask our crew and our astronauts to wear dosimetry. Dosimeters are little devices that measure radiation. You can see that these two European astronauts are wearing these little blue belts. And on here, they have these little dosimeters, which are monitoring how much radiation they're picking up. These dosimeters will be returned to Earth, and then scientists will take the data from the dosimeters and see how much radiation the crew received whilst they were in space during their six-month mission. Now, that's all very well once you're inside and behind the passive shield. It's all very well when you're inside the spacecraft, which has all of the materials around you. What happens when you go outside and do a spacewalk? In the clip here, we can see the incredible Canada moving an astronaut from one part of the space station to another. And you can see all this astronaut has between him and the harsh radiation environment of space is his spacesuit. Now, the spacesuit has to be fabric so that the astronaut can move and work. It has many, many layers to protect the astronaut against a multitude of hazards in space, but it doesn't necessarily provide that radiation protection that the crew need. So all we do is we limit the amount of time that the crew are outside. A spacewalk lasts for between six and eight hours and then they'll stay inside, and they'll maybe do one or two spacewalks during a six-month mission. But we have to monitor very carefully how much radiation the crew are picking up during one of these spacewalks. The space station itself is providing a little bit of protection. And remember that this space station is still in low Earth orbit, so it is still within the magnetic field of the Earth. So I've mentioned passive shields. But one area of research is called active shielding. This is where we take the principle of the Earth's magnetic field and try to recreate it in a device that could be used to protect spacecraft. Whilst the magnetic field of the Earth isn't actually that strong, 
it does stretch out a very, very long way. And that's what's giving us our protection against the solar wind and those solar particles. So any mechanical device that we want to make to protect a spacecraft needs to be much smaller when compared to the scale of the Earth. And if we're going to make it smaller, then we've got to make it more powerful to achieve the same effects as our Earth provides for us. The only way we can create a strong enough magnetic field in a small area is with superconducting magnets. These superconducting magnets are proposed to surround the spacecraft and generate this huge magnetic field which will deflect the particles as they come in. So this is an electromagnetic interaction between the magnetic field of the superconductors and these charged particles that are coming in. So the idea is, is that the solar wind and the galactic cosmic rays travel towards the spacecraft, encounter a, a very strong magnetic field and then are deflected away and keep our crew safe. There are many problems with this solution. The problems are that these coils, in order to generate a magnetic field strong enough, have to be massive. Not just massive in weight, but massive in size as well. This is our little spacecraft, and surrounding it is a huge, huge coil. This means it is far too large to be launched, it's far too heavy to be launched cost-effectively, and once it's up there, it needs to be maintained, because the only way to get these magnets to be superconducting is with very, very cold liquids or cryogens. Again, these would need to be supplied continuously to keep these coils running. And the whole solution becomes impractical. At RMIT University, within the space physics group, we are looking at not necessarily anything new technology-wise, but rather looking at ways to use the current materials and the existing power on a spacecraft to provide the active shielding that's required to shield against the charged particles. So our solution takes the passive shielding, it combines it with an electromagnetic shield, and then through a unique and novel configuration of those elements, provides the shielding that's necessary. So all of the other solutions that have been proposed and simulated are huge. They're, they're, they're just too big, they're too massive. And all of the designs thus far have put the coils around the walls of the spacecraft. That generates a magnetic field in the center of the spacecraft, but that's where the people are. And that's the problem. This magnetic field will damage the cells and the tissues of the humans. So just from that fact alone, it's not a viable solution. So what our solution does is it takes the coils away as from the, the, the walls in that sense and puts them elsewhere so that the deflection occurs outside the spacecraft and generates a protected void it's exactly where it needs to be, in the center of the spacecraft. So the people know that as soon as those shields are turned on, they're being protected and they're also not being damaged. We've gone back to the basics. We said, what do we need? What strength field do we need to deflect the particles? And how can we get that field from the spacecraft power alone? The International Space Station, for example, is collecting its power from the sun via its solar panels. And it's not very much. It's, it's around about 150 volts. And of course, all of that power, or the vast majority of it, is going to power the life support systems. It's going to turn, keep the lights on. It's uh, making sure the scientific experiments run. So there isn't really much left over for anything else. So what we're doing is we're devising uh, an electrical engineering solution that takes some of that power uses spikes in current, that are short bursts of current that can generate the huge fields necessary in, a, in, in bursts, not, so they're not permanently on. And what we could do is we could monitor the action of the sun 
I said that we had about one to three days forewarning before a coronal mass ejection. So if we knew that that was coming, what we could do is we could tell our crew, go into this module, which has the additional shielding. We can go all Star Trek style and say, raise shields. We can draw on that huge pulse of current that we're going to draw. We can turn off a few of the scientific experiments for a few couple of hours. We can charge up our shields and our crew can stay in just one of the modules. So we're not going to shield the whole spacecraft and they stay there in a type of bunker scenario, wait out the storm, and then we can power down our active shield and then they can get back to work. So back to our challenge of landing the first woman and the next man on the surface of the moon. So we have three to four years to achieve our goal by 2024. There are a number of phases to this mission, as I mentioned, and the second phase that's involved is to send crew from the Earth, launch them from the surface of the Earth, send them to the Moon, do a single orbit around the Moon, and then return back to the Earth. So these crew will be spending a matter of days in orbit, in space, traveling before they come back again. In terms of duration, that's short, and their radiation exposure will be manageable. The third stage of Artemis, where we start to put a spacecraft in orbit around the moon, and where we begin to contemplate landing the people on the surface, are going to encounter some additional problems. You can see here the gateway orbit is a highly elliptical orbit. And if you remember the image of the magneto tail, it may be that this orbit at certain points, that spacecraft is going to be not as well protected as we'd like. So any crew who are in the lunar orbital gateway in orbit around the moon will be protected by the spacecraft itself. It's going to be a similar design to the International Space Station, so it will be modular. And we have the benefit and the advantage of the materials and technology that we have today to build this spacecraft. But nevertheless, it's still going to be lightweight metals like aluminium, and it's still going to include this polyethylene. We're very innovative as people, and we don't necessarily need all these grand fancy things to get a working solution. So my approach is, let's put all of the materials on the table that we have. Let's put the power limit on the system that we have. And let's say, well, what can we make from this? Let's not be restricted by any of the, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, that won't work. Let's just take what we have and let's start building. I mean, at the moment we use polyethylene. I've mentioned this, it's a very simple plastic. Well, we could potentially dope that plastic, say with 1% or 2% boron. Boron is a great absorber of certain radiation. So we could give that polyethylene a little upgrade for the next type of spacecraft, but it's not expensive and it's not going to change the mass overly. I then think about the first principles of electromagnetism. To me, it's a simple solution. We've got charged particles coming in. We have the magnetic field around the Earth. Well, let's recreate that. The magnetic field around the Earth isn't very strong. It just stretches a long way. We don't perhaps have that luxury around a spacecraft, but it's the same principle. It's still an electromagnetic field that we want to generate. We just can't do it with a superconductor. So how else can we do it? There's a phenomenon called a Helmholtz coil. If you take a coil of copper wire, just any copper wire, turn it into a coil and then make a second coil out of the same copper and you bring them to a particular distance apart, they'll generate a magnetic field in the center. Now it won't be that strong, but it will still be a magnetic field. So can we perhaps get multiple of these coils and can we perhaps arrange them in a different way and create the same kind of protection that we have on the Earth. That's what we're working on. There's an additional problem for the crew who are going to set foot on the surface of the moon, a problem I haven't yet told you about, as if all the others weren't problem enough. 
the people who are going to walk on the moon are walking on a surface which itself is creating yet more radiation. You remember that solar wind I told you about, these charged particles? Those charged particles are emitted, impact the surface of the moon, which has no atmosphere like our Earth does, and it has no magnetic field like our Earth does. And instead, those particles are free to just interact and impact the surface of the moon directly. Those charged particles are then charging the surface of the moon. Those protons are traveling at such high speeds that they're actually creating neutron radiation off the surface. This was something that was not predicted in the Apollo days. Everyone was well aware of the protons and the radiation that the Apollo astronauts were going to receive. But the neutron dose that the Apollo astronauts received was actually coming up from the surface of the moon itself. So we have yet another challenge to solve. So when it comes to people traveling into space, we have to consider many, many factors. If we're going to launch off the surface of the planet in the first place, all of our spacecraft and fuel needs to be as light as possible because of the tremendous forces that are required to overcome the gravity of the Earth. That's just to get us into space in the first place. Once we're in space, we have to deal with encountering lots of objects. When spacecraft are launched, they eject pieces of their manifold, they eject rocket boosters, and these either fall back down to Earth or remain in orbit and comprise a lot of the debris that is encountered. So our spacecraft have to be robust and they have to be able to withstand impacts from debris and other objects. If we're going to go to the moon 400,000 kilometers away, then we need a huge amount of fuel. The rocket needs to be ginormous. The Saturn V rocket launched astronauts to the moon in the Apollo days, but those rockets have become superseded by the SLS rockets, and even Starship has now been contracted to send the next people to the moon. We are going to achieve this and we know we can, we've done it before. But there is a lot of talk about going further than the moon and putting people on the surface of Mars. I hope that through the lecture I've given today, you can see that these are not just fuel related challenges. These are not just about the physiological effects of being in reduced gravity for long periods of time, our astronauts simply are not going to be able to survive the radiation environment unless we come up with new solutions to shield them and protect them from all those myriad effects that are found in space. We've got the solar wind, we've got solar flares, we've got coronal mass ejections, which are unpredictable and happen at any time. There's the galactic cosmic rays, all of these things are impacting our spacecraft and they're generating secondary radiation. They're generating neutrons and gamma rays, all of which are going to damage us. And then, as if that weren't enough, when we travel to these other worlds, Moon and Mars, that don't have the luxury of a magnetic field or an atmosphere, our crew and our astronauts, as they set foot on the surface of these worlds, they're going to encounter yet another form of radiation as those high energetic particles are impacting the surface and creating an additional field of neutrons. So it is most certainly in our interest to send probes and rovers and other spacecraft to these hostile environments first, and we'll let them be our guides we will let those spacecraft advise us as to the environment that our people are going to enter. And we'll take that data and we'll take that knowledge and with it form the best solutions that we can to protect our astronauts and our crew in the future. So I lay down the challenge to all the scientists and technologists and computer scientists and anyone 
who is involved with, in material science or technology solutions. Join our quest to develop these materials, to develop these technological solutions, and let's put people on the surface of Mars. Why not? And when following and pursuing your dreams, my advice is to shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll land amongst the stars. There's always somebody who says, oh, shouldn't we solve the problems on Earth first? That statement implies that we can only have one or the other. We can either fix the problems on Earth or we can go to space, but we can't do both. It also totally bypasses that feeding everybody on the planet is a social problem, whereas space exploration is a... It's, it's scientific and it's technological, but it's also a, a fundamental human drive and desire. We are curious people. And we have this incredible situation right now where we can. We can explore space. So let's do it. Let's explore. And we are doing things to fix starvation on Earth. We, we are working on that. And we're also working to stop climate change and, and all of these other things, but those are separate problems. Those are social problems and space exploration is separate. And it's something we can do alongside fixing those problems. And so many technological solutions have come out of space flight. You know, baby milk, powdered milk came from space exploration. The, uh, Packaging food into, freeze-drying food came out of space exploration. So many technologies, uh, the, 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 the cameras in our smartphones came from the Apollo program. There are so many technological solutions that we have on Earth and we utilize daily for the betterment of society that save lives for society because we dared to dream because we dared to explore. We can do both. Good evening all, welcome to Sky for the Month for April 2022. Unfortunately, due to work commitments, I'm unable to be there in person tonight. And doubly unfortunate, you're going to be subjected to this while having to listen to my dulcet tones. I'll try and minimise that, so on with the show. I had a slight change to the highlights for the month of uh, April, May between the uh, meetings, limiting to some things that hopefully are a little more useful to you. Uh, as for the moon, we have a full moon on the 17th of the 4th, and the new moon will be on the 1st of the 5th. So those that are looking to do any imaging for deep sky stuff, uh, around the end of the month is probably the best time. As for the rest of it, uh, if you want to get up very early in the morning, you can see four bright planets in close formation. These essentially being Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Venus and Mars, all, uh, all very close together in the early morning sky. We have three meteor showers. Uh, the Lyrids meteor shower uh, has its peak on the 22nd of the 4th and the Pied Puppets meteor shower peaking on the 24th of, uh, of the 4th. Down the bottom there, the Eto Aquarians meteor shower, which has its peak on the 7th of next month. Something worth uh, having a look at if you're prepared to get up very early in the morning is Neptune and Venus have an extremely close uh, conjunction, uh, about 0.01 degree. Uh, Mercury will be its greatest elongation east, uh, the only planet visible in the evening, and that will occur on the 29th of the 4th. Uh, moving into May, we have Jupiter also very, very close to Venus, uh, 0.3 uh, degrees north of Venus. So uh, for those who'd like to get up early in the morning, uh, there's certainly some uh, stuff to look at with respect to the, 
brightest planets. And last of all, down the bottom, we have a supermoon this month uh, when it's full. Uh, not going to help with the astrophotographers, but it's also uh, involved in a total eclipse or total lunar eclipse. Unfortunately, that won't be visible here in Australia. As for the sky looking to the south uh, for April, May, you, uh, we note that we're going to lose uh, Ryan over the next uh, few weeks. However, it will be replaced by uh, Scorpio, which uh, also contains quite a few deep sky objects for people to have a look at. Uh, down the bottom, we still have the Tarantula Nebula in the Large Magellanic Cloud. However, it's probably getting a little bit low on the horizon and may be affected by uh, any lighting down there. Moving up, Eta Carina uh, Nebula is in a very good position, as is Omega Centauri, the globular cluster in, uh, in the Centaur. Over to the uh, left of screen, you've got the Lagoon Nebula. You also have the open uh, clusters of M22 and M7. Now looking around the tail of uh, Scorpio, there are actually quite a few open clusters. And for those who want to uh, have a shot at another uh, globular cluster, there's one very close to the brightest star in Scorpio, Antares, and uh, that's M4 there, uh, up top left of the screen. As to the sky looking to the north, uh, you'll note uh, over on the eastern horizon you have Sagittarius. The interesting aspect of Sagittarius is behind that is the centre of our galaxy. You can't actually see anything uh, of the centre of the galaxy and that's due to the dust and other space ephemera that is between us and that centre. Uh, moving down towards uh, left centre there, you'll note a, notice a Virgo cluster and uh, that is a, a cluster of galaxies in the constellation of Virgo. Very easy to pick Virgo, uh, Spiker is its uh, alpha star and it's quite bright. Having a look at what the planets are up to this month, uh, Mercury has just moved through superior conjunction with the Sun, basically meaning it's on the other side of the Sun towards us. As uh, the month progresses, it has a fairly rapid orbit, it'll move around to its maximum elongation, which occurs towards the end of April. Uh, it will be expected to remain fairly low on the horizon, and so not expected to be particularly good this time around uh, for viewing. Venus, on the other hand, uh, still a morning object, very bright in the eastern morning sky. It shares that area of the sky at the moment with Mars, Saturn and Jupiter. It uh, moves into Aquarius, uh, has a close conjunction with Jupiter and a very close conjunction with Neptune, which uh, Neptune is very close on the 28th and within a degree of Jupiter on the 30th. And uh, it actually gets closer to Jupiter uh, in early May. And Earth as everyone will be aware, we're heading into winter, so we're going to have to start raking up of a night uh, in the observatory. As for the outer planets, uh, at the start of the month, uh, unfortunately you missed it, Mars had a fairly close encounter with Saturn, being uh, within about half a degree. They're about the same uh, brightness, and the only way you can really pick them is uh, Mars is the red one. Uh, Jupiter is also there in the morning sky. It uh, has a close encounter with Neptune uh, at the end of April and it moves to about one degree from Venus uh, at the same time. Now, given they're the two brightest planets in the sky, it should be rather special and uh, maybe worth getting up early in the morning to have a look at. Uh, Saturn, it's also in the mix, uh, a little closer to Mars and uh, Jupiter and Venus. But all four brightest planets are in fairly close proximity to each other. Uh, Uranus, won't see much of that. Uh, it's an evening object, but it would be getting lost in the evening twilight now uh, as it approaches its conjunction with the Sun, uh, which occurs in May. 
and uh, Neptune is also in the same part of the sky as the uh, four bright planets but at 8th magnitude it's, uh, it's going to be a little bit hard to probably find it. Uh, it does have a close pass with Jupiter uh, or did have it on the 13th and it will pass within one degree of Venus on the 28th. It might be worth uh, having a go at for the astrophotographers. It may be a little bit difficult uh, even within telescopes due to the relative brightness of Venus. As to the appearance of each of the planets, uh, Mercury, you're pretty well seeing the full face as it comes out from uh, its superior conjunction. By the 20th of April, it's moved around, uh, approaching its greatest elongation, which occurs on the 29th there. And when that happens, you start to see more of the shaded back. It appears very much uh, as a crescent and uh, that much in the way as the moon does. Venus is also similar. Uh, Venus, however, is a morning object on the uh, relative to us on the other side of the sun, and hence its dark side is on the opposite side to that of Mercury. Also, uh, Mars, you'll note, has a slight uh, darkish patch on the side, uh, same side as Venus, that's because it's also a morning object at the moment. But uh, the interesting thing with Mars is we're heading towards uh, opposition, uh, towards the end of the year, and Mars will start to get a little bit bigger in, uh, in your telescopes. Unfortunately, it's still a morning object. Saturn, also a morning object, along with Jupiter there. They're always worth uh, having a look at. The thing to note with uh, Saturn is just how close its rings are, are getting. And in uh, 2025, the ring should be edge on to us as we pass through the ring plane. So over the next uh, couple of years, you can expect that ring to get uh, narrower and narrower. Uranus, uh, even though they put a picture of it here, is uh, very low on the western horizon, uh, probably in the twilight zone, so uh, not, uh, not really good viewing for, for Uranus. And Neptune is always at magnitude 8, a somewhat difficult uh, object particularly given it passes fairly close to Jupiter and Venus, the two brightest planets, it may get a little bit overshadowed. The comets this month are uh, pretty well the ones that have been around for the last few months. Uh, Borrelly, Panstars, Atlas and Kopf. You'll note uh, Comet Leonard has uh, dropped off the list here, getting a little bit far away now, so uh, not so easily seen. Comet Borrelly, very low on the western evening horizon, uh, in the twilight area, may be hard to spot, but uh, with darkness falling a bit earlier now, yeah, you may still uh, be able to catch it. Comet Panstars, expected to brighten, uh, was expected to be at night magnitude. It can still be found in the pre-dawn sky, so while you're up having a look at all those planets, uh, have a look in the Aquila. Um, you should be able to spot, uh, or may be able to spot, Comet Pan Stars. Comet Atlas, uh, currently in Gemini, uh, around 11th magnitude. Uh, you'll need to review it early in the uh, evening as it sets around mid-evening. And Comet Kopf uh, is also in uh, Capricorn. It's about 10 degrees above the eastern uh, morning horizon and it's not likely to get any brighter than its current 11th magnitude. A couple of meteor showers occurring in uh, April, uh, first one being the Lyrids, active from the 16th to the 25th, peaking around the 22nd to 23rd. Uh, they're a northern hemisphere shower that can be seen in the southern hemisphere, uh, so don't take that as looking to the south, you'll need to look north to actually see them. The other one is the Pie Puppets, it's a young southern shower, uh, visible from about the 15th to the 28th. So about the same time as the Lyrids, uh, and with the peak also at about the same time. So uh, 22nd to 24th, probably the best time this month to go uh, meteor hunting. And that concludes Sky for the month, for the month of uh, April 2022. Uh, I hope there's something in there that uh, piqued your interest, and... Uh, 
certainly maybe encourage you to get up early one morning and have a look at those planets. The information tonight was provided by Astronomy 2022 by Wallace Scores and uh, Northfield. Thank you for listening. Uh, hopefully we'll be back in person next month and you won't have to just listen to my voice. Good night. <laughs> it's actually pretty hard to pin down a scientific definition of tickling. <laughs> and this is probably because it's a phenomenon that involves a range of sensory and neurological elements. <laughs> That's quite funny. Because of this, the evolutionary significance of tickling is also unclear. In other words, why do we feel ticklish? <laughs> Some suggest that tickling is socially significant, promoting bonding between us and our friends. Others think that it serves as an alarm system to alert us to the feeling of something crawling on our skin, which only becomes funny once we realise that the sensations are coming from another human being. <laughs> but have you ever tried to tickle yourself? It just doesn't work, does it? But why? Well, here we have a person. Hello, person. All right. Inside this person is a human brain. And inside the brain, there's an area called the cerebellum, which can make predictions as to how sensations on your skin will feel caused by your own movements. So when you go to tickle yourself, your brain already has a pretty good idea of where that sensation will occur and therefore how it'll feel. So it suppresses the tickle response. Interestingly, scientists have been able to demonstrate decreased activity in the areas of the brain associated with the tickle response when people attempt to tickle themselves. So the tickly feelings of someone else tickling you <laughs> come from the fact that your brain isn't able to make predictions as to how those sensations will feel on your skin and therefore can't suppress the tickle response, which serves to alert you to the tickler's presence. Now, the best part about this is that this information can help you to disarm a potential tickler. So, the next time someone attempts to tickle you, simply place your hands on top of theirs. This will allow your brain to better predict the sensations of their hands and therefore suppress and ultimately protect you from the tickle response. How difficult is it to walk in a straight line? Pretty easy, right? But what about with your eyes closed? When we walk, we use visual reference points to monitor our position in relation to objects around us. In this instance, I can see the walls and other objects in the room to help to orientate myself. But even in a seemingly featureless environment, such as the desert, we only really need a single point of reference to help us keep a straight course, such as the stars or the moon. But in the absence of this, or in the absence of sight, we begin to encounter problems. This is because we must rely upon the other internal systems that provide feedback on our position in 3D space. This includes information about the position of your head from the vestibular system in your inner ear and information about the position of your limbs via feedback from your muscles. Now the problem is these systems aren't perfect and are prone to biases and tiny random errors. <laughs> Generally, it's your sight that helps keep all these systems in check. So, when you lose that, your idea of straight ahead also goes out of the window. Dramatically increasing the chances that you'll end up walking in circles. Oh, <laughs>
in this instance, straight into the wall. <laughs>
Classical mechanics is great. If you know the state of a system, say the position and velocity of a particle, then you can use an equation, Newton's second law, to calculate what that particle will do in the future. In quantum mechanics, if you know the quantum state of a particle, that is its wave function, you can use the Schrodinger equation to calculate what that particle will do in the future. Usually it spreads out over time as it is doing here. Note, to make this animation, we really solved the Schrodinger equation. So there's a beautiful symmetry here. If you know the initial state, you can use an equation to evolve that state smoothly and continuously into the future. The problem is, in quantum mechanics, we never actually observe the wave function like this. Instead, when we measure it, we find the particle at a single point in space. So how are we to reconcile the spread out wave function evolving smoothly under the Schrodinger equation with this point-like particle detection? Now, I think it's understandable that when the founders of quantum theory approached this problem, they considered the measurement more real than the wave function. After all, the measurement was something we had actually observed, and it matches our experience of a world of matter particles. It was harder to say what the wave function was exactly. Schrodinger formulated his wave equation because scientists, notably de Broglie, suspected that matter has wave-like properties. But it took a third physicist, Max Born, to propose how we should interpret the wave function. At each point in space, the wave function has a complex amplitude, essentially just a real number plus an imaginary number. Max Born suggested if you take that amplitude and square it, you get the probability of finding the particle there. The fact that you have to square the amplitude actually appears as a last minute footnote in Born's paper, but that is how probability was introduced into the core of our picture of reality. That's a pretty big philosophical leap. I mean, no longer is the universe deterministic. This made a lot of scientists, especially Einstein, uncomfortable. But the Born rule, as it is now called, remains at the heart of quantum mechanics because it is spectacularly successful at predicting the outcomes of experiments. So the way quantum mechanics came to be understood, and the way I learned it, is that there are two sets of rules. When you're not looking, the wave function simply evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. But when you are looking, when you make a measurement, the wave function collapses suddenly and irreversibly. And the probability of measuring any particular outcome is given by the amplitude of the wave function associated with that outcome squared. Now Schrodinger himself hated this formulation, which is actually why he invented the famous Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. Put a cat in a box with a radioactive atom. Add a radiation detector that triggers the release of poisonous cyanide gas. Now, although it was only meant as a thought experiment, Schrodinger helpfully notes this device must be secured against direct interference by the cat. Anyway, the whole point of the experiment is to magnify the state of the atom up to the state of something macroscopic and tangible. He could have picked anything, it didn't have to be alive, but Schrodinger selected a cat. If the atom decays, the detector detects radiation, releases the poison, and the cat dies. If the atom doesn't decay, the detector doesn't detect radiation, poison is not released, and the cat remains alive. Since the state of the cat and detector apparatus are directly tied to the state of the atom, we say they are entangled. Where things get weird is that according to quantum mechanics, the state of the atom does not have to be either decayed or not decayed. Generally, it's in a superposition of both, decayed and not decayed at the same time, assuming no measurements have been made. This superposition state of the atom gets entangled with the detector, and then the cat. So after some time, the wave function of everything inside the box is in a superposition of the atom has not decayed, poison not released, cat alive state, and the atom has decayed, poison released, cat dead state. So according to quantum mechanics, the cat really is both alive and dead at the same time. Only when we open the box and make a measurement does the wave function collapse and the cat actually becomes either dead or alive. These days, Schrodinger's cat is often used as a way to show how weird quantum mechanics is. But that wasn't Schrodinger's point. He wanted to show that quantum mechanics, as formulated, was wrong. So 
Taking up Schrodinger's argument in this video, I want to show that there is a better way to think about Schrodinger's cat. In fact, a better way to think about quantum mechanics entirely that I'd argue is more logical and consistent. To get there, we have to examine the three essential components of Schrodinger's cat. Superposition, entanglement, and measurement to see if any of them is flawed. Superposition is the idea that quantum objects can be in two different states at the same time. This seems like a crazy idea and something we'd never observe, but we do indirectly with the double slit experiment. Fire individual electrons through two slits at a screen, and the pattern you see is not just the sum of electrons going separately through one slit and the other slit. It is an interference pattern. We are forced to conclude that a single electron somehow goes through one slit and the other slit simultaneously. This is superposition. Of course, it's easy to understand superposition with waves. They are spread out in space. And it's clear how the peak of a wave from one slit cancels with the trough of the wave from another slit to produce the interference pattern. And luckily we know that when we're not looking, electrons are represented by a wave, the wave function. The double slit experiment then is concrete evidence that this wave enables individual electrons to pass through both slits at the same time. So superposition is on solid ground. The next concept is entanglement. Consider two electrons fired toward each other with equal and opposite velocities. We know they will scatter off each other, but we don't know exactly how. Their trajectories are given by spread out wave functions that only give us probabilities. But as soon as we measure the momentum of one of the electrons, we immediately know the momentum of the other one. It must be equal and opposite, otherwise conservation of momentum would be violated. Now, this may seem obvious, but consider that before the measurement, the momentum of each electron was in a superposition of states. Measuring one instantaneously collapsed the wave function of the other. And this would be true even if those electrons were light years apart. These electrons are entangled. What's really going on here is that after interacting, the electrons do not have separate wave functions at all. They are described by a single wave function, and this is what it means to be entangled. This explains why measuring one immediately affects the state of the other one, because the single wave function has collapsed. In fact, if we were being rigorous, we'd have to say that there is only one wave function, the wave function of the entire universe, which includes absolutely everything. But in the case of isolated, unentangled quantum particles, we can reasonably talk about their individual wave functions. And then once they interact with something else, entanglement is the result. So what we've seen is superposition is really the same thing as describing systems with waves. And entanglement means that after particles interact, they are described by a single wave function. These are fundamental parts of quantum theory, describing systems with wave functions that evolve according to the Schrodinger equation. Which leaves only measurement. Remember, the measurement postulate was added as a second set of rules to connect the mathematics of quantum mechanics to what we actually observe. But doesn't it seem weird that there should be one rule for how systems evolve when we're not looking and a different rule for when we are? When you boil it down, measurement is just the interaction of one quantum system, electrons and photons, with another quantum system. And we know exactly how to deal with that. We simply evolve their wave functions according to the Schrodinger equation. So what if we throw out all the rules associated with measurement? Well then, in the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment, the radioactive atom in a superposition of decayed and not decayed gets entangled with the detector and in turn the cat. Now remember, we are also made of electrons and atoms which obey the laws of quantum mechanics, so we are quantum mechanical too. So when we open the box, there is no measurement, no wave function collapse, we simply get entangled with the state of everything inside the box. So we see the cat alive and we see the cat dead. Now, how is that possible? I'm guessing you've never seen both an alive and dead cat before. But the solution is, it's because the you that saw the cat alive and the you that saw it dead actually inhabit separate worlds. By that I mean, they exist in their own complete realities and those realities will never interact. But where did these separate worlds come from? Well, something I haven't mentioned yet are all the particles of the environment, the air molecules, photons, everything that we are not keeping track of. 
If a quantum object in a superposition gets entangled with the environment, it is said to undergo environmental decoherence. This branches the wave function of the universe, essentially splitting the universe into two slightly different copies. So a more realistic account of Schrodinger's cat goes like this. The radioactive atom evolves from 100% not decayed into a quantum superposition of decayed and not decayed. The detector becomes entangled with this superposition state of the atom. But the detector is being bombarded by all these air molecules and photons in the box, which would bounce off differently if it is detected radiation than if it hasn't. So almost immediately, the detector becomes entangled with the state of the environment. It decoheres, branching the wave function in two. At that moment, you are split into two identical copies, one entangled with each outcome of the experiment. You continue to be identical until you open the box, but in this case, the cat actually is alive or dead. You were just finding out by opening the box. What we are unaware of is that the other outcome also happened, just to someone who is not you anymore. I mean, both observers came from you, but they are no longer you, and they are no longer identical to each other. This interpretation of quantum mechanics is called Many Worlds, and it was formulated by Hugh Everett. And if it's true, the branching of the wave function is happening all the time, so frequently, in fact, that the rate may well be infinite. Creating infinite, subtly different worlds all the time may sound implausible, to put it mildly, but consider that all those worlds are naturally part of the mathematics of quantum mechanics. Many Worlds just takes them seriously. To get rid of them requires something like the collapse of the wave function. And the point is, our experience of reality would be the same in the Many Worlds picture as it is if the wave function collapses. But the formalism is so much cleaner and more elegant. All we have are wave functions that evolve under the Schrodinger equation. The implication is that the founders of quantum theory may have got it exactly backwards. The wave function is the complete picture of reality, and our measurement is just a tiny fraction of it, the part we become entangled with when we interact with a quantum object in a superposition. The universe also goes back to being deterministic. Every outcome happens 100% of the time. It only doesn't look that way to us because we only experience our tiny sliver of the multiverse. Now, I imagine that a lot of you have questions and possibly objections to this, so I went to the expert. Hey. Hello. How are you? Come on in. Okay, so I wanted to make this video about many worlds, but I was concerned I was going to screw it up. So I've come here to uh, meet Caltech professor Sean Carroll, who has literally written the book on many worlds. Here's the book, Something Deeply Hidden, available <laughs> wherever books are available. <laughs> Let's ask probably the the common sort of YouTube questions, yeah. the the Good. arguments against this. Yes. You know what the first Maybe one is? How many how many worlds are there? No, the first one is energy, the energy. conservation. How is energy conserved is completely clear in the math. Uh, the energy of the whole wave function is a hundred percent super duper conserved. But there's a difference between the energy of the whole wave function and the energy that people in each branch perceive. So what you should think of is not duplicating the whole universe, but taking a certain amount of universe and sort of subdividing it, slicing it into two pieces. The pieces look identical from the inside, except that one has spin up and one has spin down or something like that, but they're really contributing less than the original to the total energy of everything. Uh, let's ask the question about how many worlds yeah. there are, how frequently are they branching? Right, we have no idea. Is the short answer to this. Uh, and I think it's embarrassing that we don't have any idea. Um, it's certainly often, it's certainly a lot, right? The universe branches whenever a quantum system in superposition becomes entangled with its environment. So you have atomic nuclei in your body that are radioactive. They decay 5,000 times a second. There's a radioactive decay in your body. Every one of those either decays or doesn't. You can think of it as a superposition. And once it decays, it sort of interacts with what's around it becomes entangled and the universe branches its wave function, right? So branching is happening many, many times a second just because of radioactive decays in your body. Now, is it happening infinitely often? 
We don't know because we don't know whether the total number of possible branches is infinitely big or finite. Uh, it's jai humongous by any stretch. There's plenty of room for all these branches to exist, and it might very well be finite, but that the details hinge on things we don't understand about quantum gravity and cosmology and the theory of everything and all that stuff. So it's a big number, but we don't know how big. Let's deal with the misconception that many worlds means everything that could possibly happen <laughs> happens. Yeah, that's not true. Many worlds means the wave function obeys the Schrodinger equation. That's what it means. And the Schrodinger equation predicts many things could potentially happen, but not everything. So for example, uh, an electron will never convert into a proton. It would violate conservation of mass, conservation of charge, all these things, things that the Schrodinger equation gives zero probability to ever happening. What about you becoming president? Yes. That could happen. There, like, is, there is a world in which you're president? There is a world, well, to be super duper clear, it would not be me who is president, it right. would be a version of me. Right. Right? But there Once is a, the branching happens, you're, those are two separate people now. But there is a version of you who is currently president. Yes, that's right. And who is tweeting. It's a very low amplitude world. <laughs> it's a very small probability, but it's there, yes. I mean, I think this is the way in which it feels more complicated than, or it feels more ridiculous than, yeah. than Copenhagen? Because Copenhagen's like, there's just one world, this is it. That's right. And, th and it's what you experience in... But look, the universe, the good old universe, forget about quantum mechanics, okay? Just like the cosmological universe where we see all the galaxies and everything. We don't see the whole universe. We see a finite amount of it because light moves at the speed of light. So there's a place beyond which we can't see. The universe could be infinitely big. We don't know. It's certainly very plausible the universe is infinitely big. It's plausible that everywhere in the universe looks more or less like what we see with galaxies and stars and the whole bit. If that's true, there's an infinite number of copies of people exactly like you. Some of them are presidents, some of them are winning NBA championships, some of them are supermodels, whatever. It's just because there's a lot of different shuffling around of the atoms, okay? It has nothing to do with quantum mechanics or weirdness. Does that bother you? Does that, like, rub you the wrong way? Kind of. I think, well, maybe it should. <laughs> but, but, but I, I agree it's less weird than the, the quantum idea. And I think in both cases, it's, it's because, you know, human beings, there's some cognitive bias. Uh, I don't know what it's called, but there's a cognitive bias that says the only probabilities for anything are 0%, 50%, or 100%. <laughs> and when I tell you something can happen, but the probability is really, 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 really low, people are like, but it can happen, right? <laughs> like, Let me focus on that, comp on that possibility that it happens. And I'm like, no, don't do that. It's just not sufficiently probable that it's worth worrying about in any way. When the world branches here, does it branch instantly far away? The answer is, it's up to you. This is the annoying part of the answer. I can write down a description in which the branching happens instantly throughout all of space. I use that description to make predictions about what people will see. All those predictions come out 100% completely true. I can write an alternative description in which the branching sort of spreads out at the speed of light. And I make a different set of predictions, but guess what? They're exactly the same predictions. There's no difference between what those two pictures actually predict. And what this is reflecting is, God doesn't know about branches. <laughs> There's the wave function of the universe. That's all that really exists, okay? Breaking the wave function of the universe into different pieces that you and I call branches or worlds is very convenient for us human beings. But that's all it is. It's not built into the fabric of reality itself. It's just like, it's exactly like the air in this room Rather than listing the position and velocity of every single air molecule, I just tell you the temperature and the pressure and things like that, right? It's a convenient description for us human beings. It's not the full description of the reality. And branches are exactly the same way. So if you get annoyed that there's two different ways of describing the branching, you have to remember that the whole idea of branching is just a human convenience.
doesn't take long getting the bus. If you can travel that speed. And with that, thank you very much for coming to April's meeting and uh, we'll see you next month. Sure.